Welcome. This is the Frequencies Podcast. My name is Jonah Dempsey, and I'm joined today by Larry Armstead. Larry? Hello, everyone. How is everyone? Yeah, thank you so much for joining. You can uh, find find uh, Larry's website at paralarry.com. We've been uh, texting for a couple weeks now and really having a great time on text, and it's our first time chatting. I'm really happy to put a face to a name. Absolutely. Same, same. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and what we were just talking about um, was men in human design. And you were saying, uh, you know, where are all the men in human design? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So where I mean, are we? I, I, yeah, I don't know. Um, I know I'm about six years into my experiment. Um, and throughout this entire six years, it has been in my experience, it has been all women in human design, everything that I come across, whether it's, you know, and it's been valuable information, you know, whether it's the Karen Curry Parkers of the world or the, the Jenna Zoes of the world or, you know, anyone like that, even, um, I can't remember her name, who runs the Manifesto community, but, you know, those are kind of the, the people that I have seen in human design Right. We have uh, Monique Gager runs a man. Well, oh, and then, sorry, for manifestors, that would be, probably be Adrian Roach. Uh, Nova Ohm is also involved in that. But yeah, there are some, there's a lot of big names in human design. There are not that many male, male analysts that are as big of names, perhaps, except for maybe some of the old school ones, Genoa, Blyven, um, you know, Alokanand, Diaz, of course, uh, and yeah. uh, Martin Grassinger. Uh, so we're out there, but yeah, I, I know I, I see what you're saying. Like you were kind of surveying the field and saying, "Well, this is interesting. Um, where's the yang?" You know? Yeah, it, precisely. Yeah, because I mean, it, and like I said, it wasn't a bad thing that there were, you know, that I've seen no men on the playing field. It was it wasn't a requirement for me to accept the validity of the information or to even begin undergoing my own experiment. It was just like. So are we, are we just not seen here? And then, you know, when I when I first came across early on into my experiment, when I came across Ra and his experience with the voice, I'm like, okay, so, okay, we're here. We're, we're just scattered among the fray. So it made me feel a little, a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. And there was a really interesting quote uh, I just kind of saw by chance yesterday. So I run the Human Design Catalyst Facebook group. And there was a quote that was flagged for hate speech by Facebook. And it was a quote from Ra that someone posted. So, I mean, but what he said was basically, he started saying, um, men are stupid. And that's how it started. And so that, that triggered. The, that triggered I'll tell you what. Yeah. Oh, I'll tell you what. Ra had a way of really just um, being in your face. He was very unapologetic. And he um, he explained ways in a very raw kind of way. And he, um, yeah, he was raw. He was raw in many senses of the term. And, uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and but it's funny that it got flagged. You know, it was like because I'm the admin for the group, so I see any post that gets flagged, and I said, "Please review this." And I thought, "Who posted something derogatory?" And then it was a quote about from raw. And then he also said in that same quote, he said, uh, "Human design is around eighty five percent women." And any men in human design are either very yin or trying to make money. So, <laughs> <go figure. laughs> yeah, or both, I guess. <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I think there are, I think there is something to be said for that of the yin being um, the form principle and what has been sort of rejected by the patriarchal society of the past 5,000 years. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, there is definitely a movement back toward the end with the movement to the nine centered and the movement away from from the older structures. So yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and you can see it, and it makes sense. I mean, I, I always liken liken how this works. Like you said, it's the yin and the yang. Um, I liken it because you know I have the gate defined in me, in the gate of extremes. I, I really liken it, liken it to that that whole pendulum swing that you see happening there the, yeah this um, is your, your chart here i mean i can zoom it in a little bit um but yeah yeah we have um oh you're a 952 just like me i am you i am. have that yeah yeah, yeah I, I noticed when i first sent my chart to you i was like we share a lot 
uh, right, similarities in we that chart. Born, yeah. We were born the same year, 1983, and yeah. we were born both with the Jupiter Uranus conjunct. You were um, in the earlier conjunction that year, and then it went retrograde, and then it, it uh, conjuncted again. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, very, very cool. Um, yeah, I always love to uh, see other other people from my cohort, so to speak. You know, we 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 came in on the yeah. same wave. So. Yeah, and do you find with that nine fifty two? Now, this is just kind of like a personal question that I just throw out there. Do you find with that nine fifty two that um, it can cause you to kind of spin into a little of, of inaction on certain things because we're waiting for things to just you know meet our standards and well, we're not ready yeah, to take action absolutely and here's the way that i explain it is that it's kind of um i explain it as basically sitting under the tree and everyone's toiling and working and they are all saying well you're just sitting there waiting why aren't you contributing but really what we're doing is we're we're watching and we're seeing the right way to act and then when it finally, when we do act, we hit we hit the uh, bullseye. So we we get up, we do the work, and we get it right the first time. But we got it right the first time because we waited so long, and we were able to. I mean, and also the thing is that it can be seen as lazy or not using energy. But I say it's kind of like Atlas holding up the the Earth. He's still. He's not moving. Facts. Yeah. Uh, it actually takes a lot of energy to remain still when there's an urgency and everyone's pushing you go, go, go. And we're just like a rock and we're just kind of sitting there rooted. Yeah. Yeah. That actually yeah. uses a lot of energy. So it's not that we're doing nothing during that time. We're, we're just, you know, um, yeah, but, but I do see that there is a time for action, a time for inaction and that really that stillness and kind of sitting in that stillness and, and waiting for the right time. And sometimes even our own minds can say, come on, come on, we got to do it. We got to go. Yeah. Like, well, how come I can't make myself do this yet? I don't know. It's, it's just the root knows, you know, our, you know, sacral knows they have worked out some sort of unconscious deal where they're going to start. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Absolutely. And it'd be nice if they could tell us when, because we're kind of up here and the, the, you know, we're the, you know, passenger watching the whole thing go down and going, uh, you know, you only got a week left. I think we should get started on that. So. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, like, you know, as I first came into this, um, you know, I was very much anti-human design. Like um, I, I got initiated into human design by my uh, best friend who is a manifester and she found this. And, you know, I've always been, I mean, you can see it in my chart, I, I have, you know, some of that mystical circuitry in there. So I've always been the, the since I was a little guy, this, this little uber spiritual guy, right? Like, I grew up in the church, but the church never quite just spoke to me on a level that was just amazing, right? But I always knew there was something there spiritually, um and so when she gave me human design i'd already been doing you know tarot card readings i was doing all these other things um i have a you know i i see things clairvoyantly and all these things but when she brought human design to me it was something off-putting about it and um i i have for years you know it, th this is the way of the manifest right that i've experienced um i said no i'm not doing it i'm not doing it i'm absolutely no 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 and she's like larry just run your chart and i'm like I'm not running a chart. I'm not a chart. I, I, you know, I went through that whole phase. And then, you know, I finally pulled the chart and I was like, this doesn't know me. Yeah, it does. It knows me really well. Um, but it took me like, she kind of took me along on her journey of deconditioning because she, you know, she's a manifestor. She's going to do it with or without me. And um, so she said, you know, Larry, it's okay if you're not ready. And of course I'm like, well, I'm going with you. And I looked up one day and here I am, you know, six years into my experiment. And I'm like, I have no idea how that happened, except for just her initiation and, you know, the healing and the personal development work we've done. And yeah, yeah, no, I well, And it can, it, there, that's part of the meaning of no choice for me is, you know, um, and even as a generator now, 
and I'm also, or you're an MG, but still, um, yeah. our auras, our, our enveloping auras, we kind of transmit human design through osmosis. So I have a friend who's a cross of consciousness. They're the most skeptical people you've ever met, especially on, <laughs> on the head side of it, right? And he's yeah. cross of consciousness and he's had a million and one questions about human design, but he's seen from the beginning, I, you know, I had my first reading in 2015 and he's kind of seen the transformation. We've had so many conversations about it. And he's also innocence and it kind of, oh, all of me, yeah, all of me describing to him his innocence and then the, the sacral response and then him, him basically just getting it all through osmosis from spending so much time with me. He's in the experiment, even though he didn't really choose to be. And so when I asked him, <laughs> hey, do you want to go to the Pura Vida conference thrown by Alokanand Diaz down in Costa Rica earlier this year, he was like, oh, yeah. He definitely wants to do that. And he had a sacral response. Yeah, that got an immediate sacral response out of that, yeah. Yeah, so even though his mind is going like, oh, I got to work and I got to find money and what am I going to do? His innocence is like, well, I'm curious. I want to check that out, you know. And That's so he came down there and had a blast and loved it so much. He stayed for four months in Costa Rica. He never came back. No, he's back now, but <laughs> he just stayed there. You know, I stayed for two weeks. He stayed there for four months and he loved it. And it's one of those things where he didn't really choose to get into human design. He still likes to say, oh, I don't know about rah, rah, roo, roo. He's always calling him rah, rah, roo, roo. It's kind of a joke, you know? To, so, I don't know about that rah, rah, roo, roo. He's, he's <laughs> a little too scientific, you know, when he talks about, and I say, but Johnny, it is science. It's it's design science. And, you know, we get into these. these it, I, I mean, to, to his point, I mean, it's, I, I wouldn't recommend, I mean, I would and I wouldn't recommend like like someone new to this starting with Ra because again, like you said, Ra is very Ra and he, he's going to explain things and you're like, okay, now what? Now wait, say it again to me slow, like really slow and rewind it like 15 times. So, I mean, I know when I first started, like the biggest thing for me, especially as an MG, you know, multi-passionate, I was... I was determined to not be a 6'2 on that paper. Like my my entire design at first sent me into not self. I was frustrated by my design. I was like, well, how does that work? And um I started playing with the sacral response. And that was the that was the thing that literally flipped me over and convinced me. I, I tell the story of when I was going to visit the, uh, my manifesto friend out in Connecticut. And I, there where I live, by my apartment, I said, I'm going to play with this. There's a UPS and there's a FedEx. I do not like checking my bag at the airport because I'm like, what if they lose it? So I said, hey, okay, UPS or FedEx? Immediate. FedEx. But why? No, but FedEx is more expensive. It, it's going to cost more. It's, I mean, I came up with a list of reasons from my head, from my open head knowledge of why FedEx is not the right choice. And UPS is just right here. FedEx, I'm going to have to drive like 10 more minutes. FedEx. I go on with this and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go in the opposite direction of what I'm feeling because I want to see what happens. I went to UPS and sent my bags. It took the better part. I was there for two weeks. It took the better part of a week for my bags to get there via UPS. But when I was at her apart, when I was at her house, rather, the day that I got there in my rental car, there was a FedEx truck sitting in her driveway <laughs> that my bags probably would have been on. Oh so my I was like, God, oh, yeah. I was like, oh, okay, okay, I got these, it. We get these little confirmations. And I've, I've had the same thing. I've had like, like certain protest times where I'm kind of, you know, especially at the beginning where I was really, okay, okay, let's, let's see what, what this is about. Or I would be, uh, I don't know, but I would kind of do it anyway or go along with it. Um, I have a, a really funny story from when I, uh, this is kind of another osmosis story. So I have a friend who's not into mysticism at all. I mean, he had no interest in it, but I explained the whole thing to him. It kind of, he was interested enough to at least listen to it because that was part of my experiment too, was in the beginning, I was so excited. And then I was like, wait a minute, I'm going to really, I mean, about nine months in, I started to really deeply experiment with not even bringing up anything, not even, you know, I would let them pull it out of me, you know, and I would kind yeah. of, and that was part of the, my experiment too. But in any case, um, he's he's kind of pulling it out of me at, at this point. And I'm saying, okay, well, if you really want to know, there's only one thing you got to know. And he's a pure generator. He only has the 214. And I said, there's only okay. one thing you got to know. 
And that is the uh uh-huh, the uh uh-uh. And if you, if somebody asks you something, instead of saying, well, sure, I could do it, or yeah, that sounds good, just just go, "Uh uh-huh. And if you can't do that, you're going to go, uh-uh, because you're not going to be able to make yourself go, "Uh uh-huh, if you're not really feeling it. You can make yourself say, yeah, I can do that, but you can't really make yourself go, "Uh uh-huh, if you're not feeling it. And and so you said, "Ah, I think I know just what you mean. Uh, I really wanted to go see this talk last month, but my girlfriend wanted me to go hiking with her. And I really didn't want to go hiking. And I did. And I was in a bad mood the whole time. And then she was mad at me. And she was saying, why did you, you know, all this stuff. And I really should have just gone. And I said, yeah, it's because she said, do you want to go to hike? And you're like, sure. But that doesn't mean, uh uh-huh. So then he goes, ah, well, tomorrow we're supposed to go drive for two hours to pick up this couch. And I don't even want the couch. And I don't want to go drive. It's my only day off and all this stuff. And I said, well, you know, it would be initiating to say, hey, let's not go tomorrow. Just wait for her to ask. And then just, you actually might surprise yourself. You might actually go, uh-huh, because as much as you think you don't want to, maybe you actually do and you don't realize it. And, and yeah. or, or maybe you're right about that and maybe you really don't. So we're hanging out and that evening she comes over and we're ha- having drinks and laughing and having a great time. About two hours in, they're about to leave. And she goes, hey, so are we going to get that couch tomorrow? And he just goes, uh-uh. <laughs> and it was like, that's great. that's great. And it was like so strong. And it like came, and she was like, she was shocked. Like she had never heard this. She's like, where did that come from? She's like, she like blinked a bunch of times. Like, um, I thought you said we were going to go get it. And he goes, oh, uh, well, yeah. I mean, um, I don't think we need a couch, do we? And he tried to kind of, but I mean, the, the whole tone of voice, everything changes and it, it really lowers and everything when you're really making a sacral response. I mean, not to say that we have to be in that all the time because obviously we're not making decisions all the time. I mean, right now you and I are just talking, we can be anywhere, we can, but our, our heads can be in the clouds. That's wonderful. I mean, but yeah. making decisions, we have to have that grounding. Yeah, and it's, I mean, the biggest lesson for me in the sacral response is don't try to make it make sense. Because I, here I am six years into my experiment, and I'm like, not once that I've leaned into my sacral response, does that thing ever make sense in the moment? Not like on the other side of it, I can look back and be like, oh, that's why that happened. You know, I'm I'm a martial artist, and there have been nights that I'm like, Oh God, I really don't want to go. And it's an immediate, mm-mm. and I'm like, I feel great. Why not? And the one night that I went against that is the night I hurt my shoulder and it's been a year and they're still working on uh-huh. figuring out what I did to my shoulder. Had I just sat and lay on the couch and listened to that, that mm-mm, I would have none, none of the shoulder issues that I'm having would be here, but it's about, I think, you know, people try to make that sacral response make sense. Like, they want to question why. And I'm like, the moment you throw a why in there, you've immediately thrown it up into your head and you're already kind of out of the response itself. Yeah, so, that's a really good point, right? We're trying to find reasons for everything and morals of everything. And the moral of this story is that, and is it's oftentimes it's really just about honoring and trusting um, this other intelligence that we coexist with and that we, we, the, the personality intelligence uh, can really try to dominate and control and push. And it's, it's wanting to go left and we're trying to make it go right. Or it doesn't even want to go any direction, but we're trying to push it and saying, I should be doing this and I got to get there and I I, got to reach my, uh, you know, my goal and so on. And yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's one of the biggest lessons for me because every time, and you know, I'm hard headed um you i mean look, look at my chart you can see where the hard-headedness and the stubbornness comes in <laughs> um 28 um yeah gate 28 like me we actually probably have the same uh because we're born so close together yep saturn yeah there and uh yep. yeah and you're a 55 as well and that, yep. fi- that 55 is a heck of a, a heck of a gate to have mm. um oh and that's especially- your design moon yeah 55 line six yeah, and I, I've been kind of tearing it apart in jinkies, and I'm like, ooh, yeah. Um, 
But, you know, I, I have this streak of stubbornness, and there are times that I still will get, you know, six years in. It doesn't happen nearly as frequently, but I, I will get my, you know, the appropriate response. And I'll be like, I'm going to go in the opposite direction of that response just to see what happens. And I'm like, how many times do you have to show yourself what happens when you don't trust intrinsically what's happening in your body? Yeah. Sometimes we need that, that, you know, reminder. And um, I came around on seven years and it was interesting for me that coming around to the seven years felt like starting over again. And it threw me into a lot of, um, I won't call it questioning as much as just humbling. It was a very humbling experience where, uh, because first of all, I mean, I already had a really difficult time waking up to human design. Uh, I see that your, um, your base one, that's uh, mm -hmm. base right here. And so base one, I think, even though you said, you know, it took a while for you to get, um, to be impacted enough to get into it, at least base one is curious about new things. And it, it does make sense to me when you said you were kind of anti uh, human design coming from it, because you have gate 11, as I do, which is the gate of white magic. And you don't mm -hmm. have 48, the gate of black magic. I don't have that either. Mm -hmm. So we can right. be a bit like white hats where we don't want to, you're actually literally wearing a white hat. We're like, yeah, we, we want to heal people and help people. And we don't want to um, be involved in anything that might, you know, might be black magic or something like that. that, that that's what I felt in my soul. Yeah, that was like, that's exactly how I felt at that moment. Yeah. It was, you know, I was still, you know, carrying a lot of church trauma and, you know, there was a whole lot of open ego stuff that was just driving me. You know, there was there was this intense need um, to just prove, prove, prove. You're not worthy. You're not worthy. Prove, 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 prove. And then I recognized, you know, even with the open ego, it was like, well, human design is going to have to prove it to me. And I was like, oh, isn't that nifty? So it's working as a two way mirror that you know I'm needing. I'm feeling that drive to prove and to be worthy. But I was also making human design have to prove itself to me. And it had to be worthy enough for me to even like let it in as an experience. And uh, I mean, th that's one of the, also one of the biggest things that I see that people really don't talk about that, you know, your open centers often act as two way mirrors, you know, whatever that underlying question is of the center or whatever the, the underlying energy of the center is, because it's open, it flows both directions. And you're impacted in it in both directions, knowingly or unknowingly. If you stop and just kind of listen, you'll hear it. And like you said, it was, well, I, I'm a boy from the church. I don't, I don't know if this, you know, this is astrology and this is all of this stuff. And I, I used to tour and sing and all this stuff with choirs and church choirs and all this stuff. Do you want to really put, put a name out there and be known for this? But I mean... I kind of was able to kind of bypass a little bit of that because I'm like, well, you're already online doing tarot and oracle readings. I mean, you might as well just go ahead and throw the, go the rest of the way. So, <laughs> well, and there's, uh, yeah, I just have two two comments on that. One is you're absolutely right about the open centers, and particularly when you have a lot of uh, a lack of activation. I mean, kind of how I interpret like that when it's completely open, like this ego here uh, without yeah. any hanging gates, there can be a lot of. Um, projection of I can't trust others or they're not dependable they don't keep their promises and it can actually be true yeah. so but it, when it's that open it can really feel like you have to do it all yourself you have to shoulder the whole burden whereas yeah. um, if you have a bunch of gates pointing at it there can be more self-recrimination like what's wrong with me I'm not able to hold up my promises but when there's no gates pointing it tends to actually come out more as what's wrong with them they don't keep their promises and i can't trust them and i can't depend on them i have to do it all myself obviously being single definition uh -huh. so single definition we have a lot of uh kind of over independence sometimes too you know not wanting to ask for help and not wanting to burden people oh um, yeah but but then my other my other comment just on um human design and black magic and so on just kind of an interesting <clears throat> An interesting side uh, side note. So I, I I often talk to I know and I'd like to hear more about your experience um, being a being an intuitive and and psychic and so on. I I have a good friend who's an Akashic Records reader, and she told me some very interesting information, um, which I don't talk about much because 
being a five one, I have to keep everything practical. And, uh, you know, but much of this stuff is more the mythos of human design, the mythology of it, what Ra would call the gray material, um, where it's kind of partly what the voice said, but also partly interpretive. And, but in any yeah, case, yeah, yeah, she said that her hunch was that human design has uh, been here before. And that actually it, it goes all the way back to the ancient mystery schools, the Eleusinian mysteries and further back to the temple at Luxor of ancient Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. And she, but what she said was very interesting, her intuition. And I, I've talked to her quite a bit about human design and manifestors and the seven centered being and how the, you know, the manifestors were kind of the pharaohs and the rulers. And she said, basically uh, human design at that time, was the the magical system and knowledge of the ruling class of the elites the, the manifest mm -hmm. pharaohs rulers and of the priestly caste and it was used to keep everyone enslaved so in her opinion it's actually karmic that now it's the emancipatory system that the same yeah. knowledge has now come around thousands of years later and been revealed to be the tool of freeing ourselves when it yeah. it's karmic. It's actually that it's, it was yeah. owed to humanity. This information was owed, you know, so to speak. It was a karmic imbalance that it had only been used on mm -hmm. that side. And now we get to use it for our betterment and for our personal freedom. Yeah. I mean, and, and to your friend's point, this is how, I mean, you talk about waiting for a response. You there it is. Um, it's, it, there's an idea that I have been playing with, which is how you know I came up with this idea of divine human design because I'm like this. Okay, yeah, he has he had his experience with the voice in 1987. Cool, but this far predates that. And what I looked at, like I before human design came into my purview, I was a big fan of A Course in Miracles. I still am. And I'm reading the intro of A Course in Miracles, and sh they describe an experience with the voice. And I said, hold. And then I hear, you know, Ra's experience with the voice. And I was like, that's the same voice. Because if you read how A Course in Miracles reads, it reads the same way that Ra speaks, you know, on any of his recordings or any of his uh, writings. And so I started looking again. And then I don't know if you're familiar with the law of one. Oh, absolutely. But, Where, of course, they actually are channeling Ra. Yeah, they're channeling correct. a Ra. I mean, a sort of intelligence that's called Ra. Yeah. Co correct. So I'm just starting to see this thread. They go, I'm like, it's all the same voice. I mean, and then you go back to ancient Egypt, which is, you know, I've had some past life readings, um, and I lived several lives in ancient Egypt. And who is the sun god there, the main god there? Ra. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's the same thread that's running through all of this and like you said you know at one point in time the pendulum had swung this way where this is used to control and manipulate and enslave people and now it has swung this way where it is a method to, whereby to emancipate people and get to let them get to know themselves and recognizing that the voice has always been here is has been transformational for me because again, I'm that big spiritual guy and I want to see the voice everywhere. And the moment I open myself up to seeing that voice everywhere, you can literally see it. It's like, we're tr we've been trying to get your attention. Hello, hi, hi, we're yeah. here. Well, that's something that, that Ross said also was that he's not the only one to have had these encounters and that most people who had them just weren't able to get the high fidelity or weren't able to translate it, that, that this was kind of, because of the point in history and, and how it was, this was his kind of revelatory knowledge. And you're also absolutely right about A Course in Miracles. I've loved what I've read of it and some of the interesting mythos of this, I don't know if we would call it the Christ consciousness field is what they often call it in the Ascended mm -hmm. Master literature, stuff like that. But that there was a key point in human development around the time of, of uh, you know Jesus Christ, where what that actually symbolizes for our consciousness is the ability for each of us to access this field of love and healing that we never had previous access to. And that there have just been these key developments in, in, I mean, yeah, it puts it more in context. You see where humanity was at the time of ancient Egypt, where humanity was at the time of Christ, where humanity was at the time of the Renaissance and so on, all the way up to 
our current time, which you know is an interesting idea that we're we're getting the full fidelity version of the transmission of the knowledge um, because we're just at such a key juncture in time where we're mm -hmm. we we collectively are ready for that. So. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's what's really interesting to watch right now is you know what's happening ahead of the 2027 mutation right um because i mean it's already activated it's already it's well underway right and so many people fear the 2027 mutation i i mean early on in my experiment i came across the video from Ra about six twos which i happen to be and about you know how you're either going to choose to evolve or you're going to die and i'm like my god what <laughs> you know so <laughs> That, it, it really kind of freaked me out at first, right? I was like, you mean I'm going to die? Oh, my God, what's going to happen? But, you know, and that was another thing that kind of turned me away from human design for a second. I was like, oh, screw this. No, you're telling me I'm going to die in 2027? That's not at all what he was saying. But, you know, just kind of watching the the thread of that happening, like, I, I'm, you know, you'll be 40 later this year? Yeah. Yeah, and you yeah, and, and a, in a couple months. Yeah, okay. So you just turned forty. No, no, uh, yeah, I turned so, forty in September, and and you just turned forty a couple months ago, right? Yeah, in, in February. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so I'm in the part of you know my profile where you know I'm completely up on the roof, and you know being able to watch this, you know, um, from that elevated perspective. And then, you know, kind of tapping into that, you know, my uh, my environmental variable, which is artificial shores, you know, having that separation, having to be able to see it and, you know, be actually called down off the roof, for, you know, just to even interact and to be a part of things where, you know, I would much rather lean into, I'll tell you what, I'd much rather lean to the line too and me and just like, <laughs> just be I, would rather just yeah. be, I, I would love it. Um, but of course, you know, people will always call me back out when it's time for me to interact with the world. But, you know, just being able to see from this perspective on the roof, from, you know, the shore that the shores that I create, um, how this 20, 2027 mutation is happening and how it goes with everything that's happening and has happened is amazing because, like you said, it's not new information. It's just, it's literally tracking the evolution of a human experience. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, what I, I'm excited to discover, I didn't realize this when I first looked at your chart, your design Venus is in gate nine, line one, which I have. So my Jupiter uh, Uranus conjunct is gate nine, line one. Yours is gate nine, line four. Uh -huh. What's interesting is, so gate nine is, is one, of the, one of the keys to our current cross of planning. Um, and you actually have um, gate nine, line one, which I also have, which is one of the keys to our current line. We've been in the we've been in the first line since around 1960, and yep. so we are very much needed by the collective world at this time. But what's also interesting is that post 2027, I've joked that I will retire after 2027 because I don't have any of the keys for the new Sleeping Phoenix era. I don't have those keys. But you do. You have gate 55, line six, which is the key to the spirit, basically. It's, um, it's, it's basically going to be, I mean, this is, so the spirit has been in the family for the last four yep. years. And the spirit is moving into gate 55, which is the gate of the spirit. So it's actually kind of like, it's true because the lock is gate 25, which is one of the gates of the spirit. And then 55 is the other gate of the spirit. And so 55 uh -huh. is about to be the key to 25. And it's actually 55 line six. And so uh, very, very fascinating to see that you you aren't off the clock after the no, turn. You know, I'm on the clock. No, no time soon. Yeah, and then once it changes, I can take a little break maybe. But you're you're still on the clock after 2020. Oh, oh yeah, very much. Like when I, I tell you what, when I came across Gate 55, there was this literal buzzing in my body. And I was like, what is that? And then so, of course, I ran to, you know, I, all my raw literature. I ran to Gene Keys and look at all this. And I was like, oh, 
oh, okay. <laughs> you, you got some work to do, buddy. Um, and, you know, this was just, God, maybe six months ago when I made that realization um, of, of just the heaviness of that gate because I've been so deep into, I go through little spurts of inspiration, classic MG, um, where, you know, I'm really focused in on one specific area of HD and little other things are just the outliers, right? And so at that point, I was really focused in on my, my cross, which is, you know, the left angle cross of industry. And um, I was just really focused in on there. And I was, again, I had been, I'd worked myself and spun myself into not self because, you know, that leading gate that I have up there, um, which is the 30, is, you know, all about desire. And you're, you're always going to desire. You just have to accept the, the desire. And I'm just like, I, <laughs> I don't want to, you know, that to always be a thing, but I see where it's played a role. And then I just happened, I said, well, what's, what else is here? And I kind of come down and I see that 55 and I have been stuck there since just picking it apart and realizing that my entire life has been a preparation for what's about to unfold. Mm. And yeah. 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 Well, and even just being a sixth line and going into this new era, which is a sixth line era and yep. seeing what a tremendous time of transition it is and it's so interesting that we get to the foundation right before the transition and it, it's going backwards where normally we start at line one two three four five and then six at the very end it dissolves but when we're when we're um going with the global cycles the end of an era is the first line so we finally get to the foundation and we're really at i mean i think with covid everyone kind of sees that the old world is gone and we used to make fun yeah. of, uh, I mean, even just a few years ago, making fun of the boomers thinking that the past was always better and kind of this Edenic past. But now people are like, heck, just five years ago seems like that. You know, it's, it's sped up so quickly that, uh, yeah. that we're in such a, a time of global crisis. But it's also interesting to see that it's not just crisis, it's that we have the strongest foundation that we're going to ever get now. And it's, that's why we got human design. That's why we are, you know, 61.1 has been the um, key to gate 13. So we've been able to understand our collective history and the stories we tell and how we arrived here, gate 13, through the lens of occult knowledge, 61 line one. And so yep. we've been basically given not just human design, all the occult knowledge. I mean, you can learn yeah. five element astrology and you can learn every, every different kind of occult knowledge under the sun has been distributed really um, in, our, in our lives in these past. And I, and I, and I will even say this, and this, you know, again, I'm so far removed from the church, right? even though that's what I was brought up in, right? But I even tell people who are still dealing with church hurt and church trauma because I, work, I act as an, an alignment coach as well, right? I help people live their design, get into design, understand all that stuff. But when I say to people, oh, there's beautiful wisdom that is found in your, and the Bible that's sitting there dusty on your nightstand. Like even the transmission of that wisdom, like it gets lost because it's become so politicized. And then, you know, I take it one step further and I said, you can pick up any holy book. You can pick up any book of magic, any book of spells and the same, you can, it's, it's a literal voice and it's a thread you can pull and it's the same wisdom and it's the same knowledge and it's the same all across the board. And having access to, you know, we're in an era where we have access to all of it at all times. And I think that is the most beautiful thing in the world because people are finally getting to make their own decisions. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, yeah, I've I've gone through a similar sort of experience of seeking and seeking and then finding what is unique in human design, but also seeing how each different um, spiritual tradition or even wisdom tradition has its own slice. And it's kind of like, the, the, the blind men in the room with the elephant and they're all asked to describe what the elephant is like and one grabs the trunk and one grabs the tail and one grabs the leg and they're all, this yeah. is the elephant. And it's like, no, the whole thing is the elephant instead of arguing, it, which actually reminds me, there's this great quote from J.S. Mill. He said, in arguments, we tend to be wrong in what we deny and correct in what we affirm. 
So we, we tend, if we say yeah. this is true, it tends to be right. But if we're like, you're wrong, we tend to be wrong about that because not to just to say relativism, not that everyone's right. I mean, obviously someone who says, oh, you know, there's some very toxic beliefs out there and so on. Oh, but yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, I guess what I'm trying to say, though, is that when you get into wisdom traditions, um, some of it can be what we might call propaganda for a particular set of gates. I mean, that's when, when Ra looks at the godheads, he kind of shows how each... Um, I mean, it's not that what they're saying is incorrect. It's that they're saying that that's the only thing and there's nothing else out there. That's what's incorrect. So you can say, yeah, it's really, really important to turn the other cheek. Well, it is. It absolutely is. And that's beautiful. I've gotten yeah. so much. I, I've actually been lucky in that I was not raised in the church. So it's been much easier for me to accept and embrace wisdom that I have gained from holy books of Christianity, Judaism, and so on. Um, you know, Islam, I love Sufism. I, I've, I've read different, different holy books and I've got a lot out of them because I wasn't raised in it. So I didn't have that church hurt or church trauma that you were. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was easier for me to get. But I also see that it's really, um, it's just important to realize that, that, those, that those wisdom traditions are essentially going to be very crucial at, for people at certain levels of their personal development. And what is extremely profound for one person might not be profound for someone else. And that's okay. Yeah. And that part of it is realizing that we're at different levels of what we can take in. And so even when you're saying like, you don't start with giving people raw, well, of course, I'm, I, it probably depends on the person, right? Like somebody who you Facts. think can handle raw, you know, <laughs> you, you give them raw. And, if, and I pretty much start with raw only because the people that come to me tend to be the ones already. Um, but if I were doing a different offering, I might, um, you know, I, I might start with, with something else. I mean, even still, I often tell people to get the uh, Linda Bunnell book with raw um which is brilliant it's a brilliant book yeah yeah, yeah it's, it's a great, it's a brilliant book mm -hmm. yeah it, it's one it's one of my favorites one of the foundation i mean i think everybody's on a copy of that one um i have because you know i have all of my hd stuff um i have it in digital and i have it in you know print hard copy because i'm like oh i need to have this with me at all times and you know of course i can't go around carrying a big stack of books at all times but Having it available digitally, like, you know, the Linda Bunnell book uh, with Ra, I mean, it's one of the, um, I would say, foundational books yeah, that it, anybody well, coming into this it. should have. Absolutely. It covers it. And uh, I have Ra's black book and white book, and those are wonderful, but those are just more, um, they're really fun when you've already kind of gotten into human design and you want to, like, see how Ra first formulated it. Kind of like uh, you you get really into a band and you, you want to hear their early material and, and things like that. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, and we all have a different way of getting into it. So I started to mention earlier that your uh, base one and base can kind of show um, somewhat our trajectory into human design. Um, I'm base two, which Ra called the hardest base to wake up, basically. <laughs> base four and base two, <laughs> the hardest to wake up. And the reason is because, uh, so base one is the principle of movement and it's always looking for something new. So mm -hmm. base one people can get into human design simply because it's so different that even if they have some you know, reservations or they're not sure about it, at least they go, wow, th I haven't heard this before. You know, I got to check this out. Yeah. Something yeah. And base one is really interested in new things. You find a lot of base one people are very cutting edge and they're into new music and they're into, they just get into things nobody else is into. So they're kind of the avant-garde uh, of their, their social group. Um, base two is where we get a lot of status and a lot of, um, well, it's interesting. So base two is definitely, it's hard to wake up because it's the principle of mind. And now I will say, I will mention you need a very precise birth time. I always tell people like if they are base one, I say, learn about base five and learn about base two to make sure you're not one or the other. And also see where it changes because base changes every seven or eight minutes. And so if you're right at the end of base one, there is a chance you could actually be base two. And that would yeah. let some explanation for the initial resistance to human design. Because I find that base twos and fours are the most resistant 
in the beginning anyway. Uh, and then we become yeah. the evangelists. So you might actually, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to, I, I always, when it comes to base, I always try to explain the adjacent ones as well, just in case there's a little movement there. Um, yeah. But as I, base, I mean, I was, yeah. Oh yeah. Go on. I, no, no, I, I was blessed enough to actually have um, my actual birth time. Um, didn't know I had it until I went and, you know, just pulled out the, dusted off the old birth certificate out of the safe. And I was like, oh, be damned, it's actually here. And that makes me so I, happy when that happens. Oh yeah, twelve twelve fifty five p.m. and I was okay. like, yes. <laughs> so so we should still just check to make sure twelve fifty six p.m. isn't base two. But other than that, we can be pretty sure you're base one. You know, if if um, yeah. And that's the, because I always like when it's a number like that. Like for me, it was eight forty eight p.m. and I can be pretty sure it was eight forty eight because why didn't they just write? You know, they didn't write nine or something like that. So. um but in my case, base two makes a lot of sense, and uh, and you could you you could read about them and see. But um, it, I was very resistant to human design, not really knowing why. But I first encountered it in 2006. It wasn't until I got a reading in 2015 from a young woman who's a two four reflector who Ooh. generously yeah she generously gave me like four hours of information about human design. We just talked and talked and talked. And it was at a real low point in my life where just like when the um, you know, immune system is down, you can catch a virus. Well, when your psychological immune system's down, you can catch the human design virus. And that's what I did. <laughs> I caught it. I caught it. I couldn't get rid of it. As soon as, you know, I'd heard about it nine years before. So when she showed me my body graph, I was like, oh, I've seen this. I thinking kind of, isn't this like Scientology or something? I mean, I didn't really know. Um, yeah. I thought it might've been a cult or I thought it was a scam or all this stuff. I mean, I was just so skeptical um but then it really got in and i couldn't get rid of it and about nine months later i had my own i wouldn't really call it a spiritual awakening i call it the, sac the sacral awakening where i started to really have <laughs> um my mind kind of went into the background and instead of it being the foreground it went to the background and if somebody wasn't talking to me it was just kind of background chatter and what i actually became aware of was this physical embodiment where I could just kind of just move through the world in a different way without being so anxious and trying to overthink everything and asking myself all like I wasn't like thinking well should I do this or should I do that I was just kind of much more embodied and it lasted about eight days for me and then I, I like to joke that everything since then has just been trying to get back to that because that's how it always is when you have a, a, a you know realization yeah. of any kind i mean even for Ra with his his eight day experience mine didn't have a voice but uh in his eight day experience i mean that was about the most amazing thing that ever happened to him and he talked about how after that experience he really had a um a real come down of when it sunk in that he would never have an experience like that again yeah uh, so that was that was like the closest he came to being really depressed you know uh until he discovered the transits he said the voice was his first teacher. His second teacher was the moon because he could watch the moon activate a center and he could feel that activation in his body and that blew him away. And he basically learned so much from that. Yeah. And I mean, to your point, I, that, that kind of transformational experience does tend to lend, lend itself to you. Like, I'm never going to feel this again. Like, Mine is a little um, different in that, you know, I'm 40 years old now, but when all this, I want to say spiritual psychic stuff woke up in me, right? I was 15 years old and I foresaw the death of my brother. Nothing like this had happened before then, you mm -hmm. know, but I was, you know, we were after church and we were at my aunt's house and I was sitting at the bar um, and we were just talking and it was like, I was picked up literally and transported into what I call as like big spiritual IMAX. And I literally foresaw the entire death of my oldest brother. And then, then all of a sudden I'm back and I'm like, did no one see that but me? And everyone's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, so, you know, I go home and as a 15 year old freaked out and I tell my mom, I just saw, you know, Carl die. And of course she's like, don't say that you're going to speak it into existence. I'm like, I'm not saying it. I'm repeating it. Like, I'm telling you what I just saw. 
And for a year, nothing happened. I was like, but I kept it in the back of my mind because I'm like, I'll recognize the energetics of this. I'll recognize how I felt in that moment. And one morning I woke up and the day felt different. And I, you know, walked outside my door and I, my, my parents had friends coming over and they were bringing in, bringing in coolers. And I'm like, oh, oh no, 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 no. This is it. This is it. This is it. And I'm starting to reckon. It's like a very overwhelming deja vu feeling. Uh, and I'm starting to recognize pieces. And I'm like, I got to go. I got to go. If I change where I'm at and what I saw, then it changes everything. And then I, you know, drive up the road to my aunt's house. And I'm like, you know, sitting in my car and I'm like, 16 years old, you know, at this time, I'm like, whew, I have changed everything. My brother is going to be safe. And I walk up to my aunt's house and they you, you kind of open their door and you look down and there's a landing. And I was like, I put my hand on the door now, but I'm like, oh shit, please don't let the door be open because they're notorious for keeping the door locked. I'm like, and they would, you would never have their door unlocked. And I'm like, please don't let this door be open. Because if it is, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. And I turn the hand, the knob, and the door opens. And I said, oh, my God. And I see my aunt at the bottom of the landing. And she's on the phone. And I'm like, she's about to drop the phone. And she's going to run up the stairs past me and say, we got to go. And that's exactly what happened. And I just sat on the top step. And I just said, oh, good God. And she didn't say a word about what happened. Yeah. And from that from that moment, at 15 years old, I don't know what that was that activated. I couldn't tell you to this day. But this, all this has not let up since then. And I mean, this is 1999. So the internet's still pretty much an infant. And so I'm at the library checking out every book I can on mysticism, spirituality, witches, ghosts. Like I, I'm trying to find an answer, you know, that again, being very curious. And, you know, you look up and here I am, you know, many years removed from 1999. My brother's been gone for quite some time. And I'm like, on some levels, I look at this, that activation as a gift. But those 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 months after especially when I really dove in and was curious and just ingesting information and just playing with it on the other side of it, you know, it lends itself to a certain depression because God, I'm, I'm never, I'm never going to feel that level of activation or draw or magnetism again until you do until human design jumps in to the, to the driver's seat. And it's like, Oh, it's back. Yeah. Yeah, well, and that is, and thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, um, I think that's a really, there's a really good point that people come to human design at all different levels of development. And whether we use the metaphor of psychological development or spiritual development or maturation, one, one of the systems that I really like is the Theosophical Society. And they have a theory of levels of initiation. And these levels of being initiated have been mirrored through organizations like the Freemasons where they do a ritual and they put you know, a crown on you or they put a tabard on you or whatever, you go through different levels. But that's really just a metaphor for it because the real initiations happen internally in the soul and they're yeah. spiritual, they are spiritual initiations. And according to the theosophical literature, especially a man named Benjamin Cream, who I'm a big fan of, he isn't with us any, anymore. But he did a lot of work on the levels of spiritual initiation. And essentially, the idea is that the first level of initiation, level one, uh, only around 800,000 people that are currently living in the world have achieved. So it's a very small number when you consider the 8 billion people in the world. Yeah. And what that level is, is already a tremendous, huge, huge achievement. And that achievement is... Um, to, to essentially trust yourself and your own, what we could even call inner authority. And he even uses the words, you no longer trust any outer authority. You no longer, you truly are kind of awake to your, um, to, to your own inner decision-making power. And so I think that's a big part of what human design is trying to bring people to in that you're not just trusting science or what people told you or parents or things like that. Now, the interesting thing is um, that level one does not yet gain the kind of powers you're talking about. That doesn't happen until level two. And there's all these incremental levels, by the way. 
Cream thought yeah. that most people were around 0 0.3, but then a lot of celebrities and filmmakers and things like that were 0 0.6, 0 0.7. He actually put George Harrison at level 0 0.9 at the end of his life, that he was right on the precipice of spiritual awakening. Um, John Lennon was 1.6, and Paul McCartney, who was thought to be a reincarnation of Vivaldi, was level three. So it's kind of, there's a whole range. Um, and he didn't list... Uh, he actually didn't list Paul McCartney because he wouldn't list anyone who's still living. So McCartney might be higher. He just listed Vivaldi, who was a previous incarnation. And so the other interesting thing is that you only ever really develop higher. But of course, when you incarnate again, you have to catch up to where you were because it's not like, yeah. I mean, every now and then you have a five-year-old kid who's like the Buddha or something. But generally speaking, even if you already <laughs> achieved level 2.8 in your past life, you still have to go through those initiations again in this life but it just happens much quicker and much faster to accelerate and then you kind of get you catch up to where you were before now level two is where you begin to get psychic abilities so i would say regardless of what level you were in previous lives you know you might have already been level four in ancient egypt for all we know right but but yeah. um, but in this life, you achieved level two around uh, age 15 in their system, because that's when you unlocked your, your psychic talents. Yeah. It's, yeah. So anyway, that's just one, one explanatory system. I mean, I'm not exclusively hung up on their version of it. It's kind of like that whole elephant thing, right? Everyone has a different piece of the elephant, but that's their way of describing it. And something I like to remind people is that Human design it doesn't give the same thing to this to everybody. Like people coming in at level 0 0.9, you know, if George Harrison had found it before his death and he was at 0 0.9, it could have helped him get that push over the edge to level one. And that's what it's trying to bring people to, strategy and authority. But somebody who already has a handle on that strategy and authority, what it's bringing them to is a greater appreciation and understanding of the bigger picture of, of what they're here to do and things like the global cycles and things like that. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, and you know, what I find really funny just kind of going back to that elephant analogy it, and it's something I've said for years and it's something that I actually teach, you know, my, my students and my clients is look at our, how fractured the medical medical system is, for example, in the Western world. You can say, you know, you'll you'll look at so many things. A dermatologist will say, well, th this is how you can, you can tell. Then you have a dentist say, no, 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 your teeth are how you can tell. Then you'll have, you know, somebody who is an optometry say, no, this is how you can tell. And then you'll have, a, you know, somebody who's in, you know, um, you know, blood science. Like, no, no, the blood tells everything. None of it is separate. What you guys aren't realizing, what we're not realizing, I think, is that we've all been handed a piece of the puzzle. Instead of saying this is the only puzzle piece and focusing there, what happened? The magic is when we start snapping into to together, when we can say, oh, this works with this, and, and you get a more complete picture. But, you know, I always say that when we incarnate, we come into this life with this puzzle box of, you know, a thousand pieces, but there's no image on the outside of the box. So you don't know what you're snapping together. And it's not one of those puzzles that's, um, it's an amazing picture, right? It's this puzzle that is a, I always see it in my mind as one of those gradient puzzles. Like it's just one one color that fades into another. And like, what, what do you, where do you begin? It all looks the same. I promise you it all snaps together. I promise you there's connection piece for each of it. But there's so many of us that are content to say, oh, this, the, my puzzle piece is the only piece and once we can realize, like, I, I can I can look at human design and say, I'm grateful for this piece. It is not the only piece. I'm grateful for Course in Miracles. It is not the only piece. I'm grateful to have found and collected the pieces that I have. What other pieces are there? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I wanted to mention on the topic of Course in Miracles, something that I've, I've gone through that uh, material here and there, and I, I really appreciate it. Um, there's a tremendous, there, he's uh, no longer with us, but uh, Randy Richmond Jr. Um, was just a fantastic, incredible uh, human design analyst and teacher and instructor. And he actually worked a lot with Alcoholics Anonymous, with AA and things like that, bringing human design to people in AA and just working with um, all sorts of issues. And, and he, he was really an incredible 
teacher and he was an, an instructor for a, a, a you know course in miracles and he he said that he still um really got a lot out of it the only reason that he he found human design um to be superior in some ways is that many of these systems can't really differentiate between you and the person sitting on your left or the person sitting on your right. So it gives you something that can be incredibly valuable at a certain phase of development. It can be that missing piece of the puzzle. It can be that aha moment. But then what he loved about human design was that it, it gets to this level of differentiation that um, is almost the reward for having gotten, it's kind of like as you zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, you finally get to this this nuanced thing. Now, at the same time, if you give human design to somebody when what they need is a course in miracles, they can end up getting stuck in human design for years and not being able to make the changes and the growth in their life to have the development to get to that next step. So it really is what is the piece for that person at that time. For me, Carl Jung was a huge piece of the puzzle. Oh me. gosh, yes, yeah. yes. When I was in high school, Jung got me through high school. I mean, I I don't know that I would have been, I mean, I definitely wouldn't have been the same person I am today if I didn't have that. It was the deepest solace and the deepest comfort and the deepest, um, it just kept me going. I mean, it was sustenance for me. It was food, really, right? And so it's like, what yeah. is feeding us? That's really the question. What feeds us? And if it feeds you, nobody should shame someone and say, you're getting fed from that. That's feeding you or, you know, no, I mean, it's food, it's food and it's, it sustains us and it's, mm -hmm. So, I mean, and it's, you know, it's, it's about, you know, people recognizing the, you know, the biological reaction of shame in your body. You know, you have the genetic trauma of shame that you can find in human design, but, you know, shame also shows up in the human experience as a complete biological reaction. And it's there as a way to, you know, triangulate yourself and keep yourself actually safe and acceptable by the large collective. Because if, you know, you shame and disown and disregard one part of yourself, you know, and put yourself aside and are ashamed for something and you begin to agree with that shame, it keeps you safe because then you align with the values, even though they might not be in alignment with you, you align with the values of those who are set to protect you. And because we're tribal species, we need each other to survive, right? Especially growing up, you can't go throw a baby on the side of the road and expect it to survive. You know, a newborn, it's not going to happen. It needs its parents. But, you know, for the first 10, 12 years, you don't have any autonomy over your body, where you're going, you know, what the situations you're going to put yourself in. So you you do begin to kind of triangulate yourself or fragment off and say, you know, I'm going to disown this side of myself. I'm going to push this side, this part aside, and I'm going to present this side, even though it's not the truth of me. And then you we're, we're left with all of this shame, which we don't realize literally is a biological reaction to not living in alignment to our truth and who we actually really are. So kind of to your point, you know, if what someone needs is this and they're getting their, their food and their sustenance from this, it's really hard, especially for somebody coming like me, like I'm a little gay guy from the Midwest, right? So I have everything going, right? I'm gay, I'm from the Midwest, um, you know, I'm in the Bible Belt and I'm, I'm letting it all fly, right? And you you have those members of church, you have those members of family that look at you and you're like, are you serious right now? Very, because it lines up with me. It lines up with what works for me. It lines up with what's feeding me. And I don't have to look externally for the validation when I have my own internal authority to trust. Mm -hmm. mm, oh, that's so so beautifully said. Yeah, and we need to be on alert for even just gene keys shaming or uh karen curry yeah. parker or jenna zo shaming or you know there's all of this kind of elitism which obviously everything goes into hierarchies and there's going to be tribal niches but um as far as i'm concerned as long as it's really done i mean there are there is a sort of a standard and the standard to me is that it's done with sincerity and not um as a trick or something like that but i really appreciate uh, all of the sincere, earnest efforts to understand this magical, mystical world where, yeah. and I don't, yeah, I, I love Richard Rudd's work. I mean, that's a, a great example. I know that some people um, who are into human design don't want gene keys to be mixed or something. I mean, to me, uh, Richard Rudd is somebody who 
studied with Ra, and then he had his divergence from Ra to go on and, and live out his own path and his own trajectory, and that's what he's done. And the proof is is in the uh, pudding that he's done a tremendous amount of new material and incredible interpretations of things and added so much richness to it. Um, Steve Rhodes is also someone who's really gone his own way from Ra. He studied and, and learned human design and even did a biography of Ra. Um, but then he made his own system that he calls Bantu based on the Ban and the Two, which were the kind of yin and yang crystals from the original Big Bang. And I love Steve Rhodes' work. So yeah, there, there can be some real... Um, issues. I mean, I, I, so I run the High Desert Human Design Conference, and I also do Santa Fe Human Design Library here and run the Center for Human Design. And there are questions around ethics and standards and things like that. So I've been forming these standards bodies, um, but the standards bodies aren't there to make sure nobody disagrees with Ra. They're there to enforce a standard of scholarship that is clear about if it disagrees with Ra, I'm wonderful. And then say, I disagree with him. I think that this is this is what he said, is what I say. If you don't want to talk about Ra at all, that's fine. I mean, you can just talk about the system and the material. It really stands on its own. Um, the standards committees are really there to ensure um, really a spirit of hospitality, generosity, inclusivity, things like that. So, uh, but it's been interesting yeah. kind of having these you know organizations now and having to put on my um, you know, organizational hat and, and working with the WA and the Penta and all this stuff. Yeah, and it, it makes, and I'm glad you, you would kind of explain the organizational system the way that you've done, um, because there there are certain things that I'll hear from Ra, and I'm like, I completely disagree with you. Um, you know, one of the big things, and I, I will get crucified for this, and I'm fine with it, um, you know, saying that, you know, manifesting generators are not a fifth energy type i will say i completely wholeheartedly disagree um you know for me the way i view it is i'm like you know there are fifteen thousand types of bread in the supermarket but you know wheat bread is a lot different from rye or pumpernickel um they're still both breads true yeah. yeah so you know it's it's that kind of thing but i don't mind you know i, I my degrees in sociology so I, by default, I was trained to be, to play devil's advocate, right? Yeah. So when I hear something, I'm like, I'm going to challenge that just because I can. And, yeah, uh, well, was... and also what, what productive can come from that? Because if somebody says, this is not that, I, I don't try to say, well, no, it really is that, or what is it, or is it not? I just say, what do you mean by that? And it, it raises the question, what do we mean by type and what, and maybe in one sense, there are five types. In another sense, there are four types. And maybe those different senses depend what level we're talking at. I mean, about, I absolutely see manifesting generators operating very differently in the world from how I operate as a generator. I, mean, I feel like yeah, a turtle yeah. compared to y'all. You're running all over the, <laughs> juggling the plates and, uh, you know, spinning the plates and I'm, uh, I'm plodding along. And yet I also have a deep commonality in that I can hang out with manifesting generators and generators together. And we're all in this big bear hug together. And it feels like yeah. we're just, you know, so there's, there's a deep commonality and there's also a difference that's worth exploring. And I, I think both are valid and it's not to just, it's not to just say every opinion is valid, but to say that if an opinion has merit or if a perspective has merit, that's because it's able to show us something we couldn't otherwise see, to reveal something that was previously hidden. And so by saying manifesting generators are a fifth type, if you can then describe how that is different and how that does work, yeah. that is valuable. And that has merit because we're now able to see something we couldn't see before. Yeah, absolutely. It's all about bringing things, you know, from you know the shadow into the light you know it's the it's the magical work of you know bringing what is subconscious conscious um what was you know inaccessible now is accessible but you can't do it if you don't know what you don't know right so it's about being able to tune in and listen to that small buzz of that frequency and it's like okay i can i can actually bring this in um and like i said there there are there are traditionalists that will look at what i just said and be like Oh no no he is a no get get him out of here and I'm fine with that 
you know, well, you, you know, do have gate 10, line five. I'm starting to see where some of this heretic side uh, comes from here. <laughs> I'm starting to, yeah, you know, you're you're definitely a heretical role model, you could say. <laughs> That's what, what I do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but it, it, it made but it made sense for me, right? Because I've all you know. The, I always say, you know, I'm a sociologist by nature. That's what I was trained to do. But, you know, we can see it right there, you know, on my chart. It's it's who I am. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, this has been absolutely wonderful. So uh, I think we have plenty more to talk about, but let's wrap up for today. I just wanted to ask um, if you could just kind of describe a little bit, maybe as a final thing to talk about divine human design and Div yeah, because you're calling it divine human design. And I, I like that. I, I like when there's differentiators, right? I mean, um, differentiators in the sense of of you have your own perspective on it. So Ra had human design. Larry has divine human design. And you're yeah. putting in your own views on that. So, I mean, I know we've covered some of that, but if if there's anything you would add or just to describe a little more about, about your take on it, um, Sure, sure, sure. Incorporating your work as a psychic intuitive as well. I mean, do you, I mean, I guess that's kind of a, that's going to, you're going to bring that with you to everything I would imagine. Yeah, I can't escape that if I wanted to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but it does incorporate that as well. But what I started doing, how this even came to be, um, is I had a little pouty session and I was like, I want an experience with the voice and, you know, spirit was like, hold my beer. And, uh, you know, I, there was a night that I looked, I was sort of looking through A Course of Miracles and I'm like, there's 364 lessons in the uh, student for uh, the, the workbook for students. And I started looking at the, the gates and the channel configurations. I'm like, wait, there's 384 here. Hold on. Some, whoa, 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 whoa. And then so what I, I did is I literally just took, um, I have a little document that I'm looking at right here, but I started seeing how the lessons of A Course in Miracle actually overlay on gates and how they overlay on channels. And they actually agree with Ra's explanations of how these gates and these channels actually behave. And I was like, and then, you know, that's when I, you know, read the, again, the, the beginning of A Course in Miracles and saw it was the same voice. And I'm like, Oh, there's something here and then I just started digging and I got into the law of one and I was like oh there's there's more here and so I just started putting all these overlays over the top of it to get a more fleshed out um version of human design and right now I'm up to you know eight different spiritual and mystical modalities that I like I can literally see entry points where they're feeding human design and they're not taking away from human design they're enhancing it. They're they're bringing something more to it. And so when I teach human design, I teach it classically. And then when the person is ready, you know, when the, the student's ready, the teacher will appear. Um, I begin introducing more of, okay, you, you guys got this. What about this? And so that I use these other mystical and spiritual modalities to expand on the concept of, of human design because. I tend to attract a lot of uber spiritual, you know, people and human design can be very, um, at, at times it can be very rigid and scientific sounding, but if I can give you a spiritual overlay on top of that, and you can say, oh, this goes with this and this, you can explain this through the lens of this and it's still the same message. We have something there. So that's how divine human design was born. And that's kind of what I teach. Oh, I love that. I love that. And I, um, I do a lot of extracurricular studies as well i mean i mentioned theosophy i also love the cards of destiny also known as cards of the magi or love cards the tarot um, various forms of numerology i mean i i've i was very into a lot of different mystical studies before human design then human design pretty much was my holy grail and occupied most of my studies for quite some time but uh then i you know at, at different times i kind of would go back to or learn about new systems. I also love Enneagram. Um, I love you. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I'm a big fan of those. And so, um, 
Well, I think that's wonderful. And I'd love to see uh, if you, in the, I, I know I'll, I'll be checking out paralarry.com, P-A-R-A.com. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be looking forward to any videos you post or any transcripts or lectures or books. I know you have a book out, uh, which is not about human design. Um, yeah. Yeah, this book actually predates human design. Um, the book is called Where's My Pizza? How to Use the Power of Expectation to Create the Life You Want. Um, and it's kind of, it's based on the law of attraction and it's based on the law of assumption um, that Neville got to talk a lot about. Um, and just how to actually literally tune into those frequencies and to literally create the life you want. And it's actually um, going through a re-release. I had no intention of re-releasing this book it came in 2018. I was good with it. And of course, it came back around and said, you know, update the book as a revised and expanded edition because you have information now that you didn't have in 2018. Um, or that you didn't, you know, you weren't really sure of in 2018. So I have, there was a specific chapter in there that talked about, you know, trust your intuition or trust your gut. And I had a a cousin who um, came to stay with me and she's a projector and she's a mental projector. And she was like, I've always thought that trust your gut or trust your intuition was like, I thought that was just something people say. I was, and I looked at her chart. I was like, Oh, you don't have a gut defining you to trust. Do you? She was like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was like, she's like, Oh, Can so I this... trust your gut. Is that okay? <laughs> yes. yes. So I saw that and that was like, Oh, that's not right for everybody. And it began the process of me taking the book and I'm in the um, kind of in the the final sprint to um, finish the re-release of the book. So the original is still available on Amazon, but the new one will be coming out, I would say probably September um, to order. That is so exciting. Well, I am just so excited to see uh, where where it goes with your writing and speaking and, and all of it. And I hope we get to meet uh, in person. And I also hope you'll be a guest again, because I think we have a lot to talk about. And I'd love to go into more of your experiences and what brought you into human design, your experience with your um, you know, manifester friend, all of it, and uh, even just so much more. I, I'd love to just, you're, you've been a wonderful guest and I really appreciate having you on today. So, um, I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate that. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Uh, tell thank me. you.